of the fact that the new D&D set in Ravnica is coming out in November. Now, by... Um, I have a friend uh, who I played a lot of D&D with and to be honest with you, it's quite enjoyable to play D&D with. Uh, and I basically told him about, I was doing these videos and I asked him, hey, if you want, I'll do, do the next video I do will be on a plane that you pick that I have. And he has chosen Amunket, the Egyptian plane ruled by the draconic planeswalker. And where Gatewatch has suffered their most tragic defeat yet. Now, now Shooting Death or Dakota, whichever you like to sometimes go, uh, prefer going by. This is a big shout out to you. Um, I hope you enjoy this video. Now, Amuket is one of the planes that I do not know all too much about I, I gave it one read over once before and then that was it but from what I can tell tell you it is a world filled with possibilities and adventure from ancient runes and every single image is just stunning and I, and again a lot of these images tend to be taken in the from cards or the story like and one thing I really enjoy folks is in every single image, there's a similar symbol or something in the distance that res resemble horns. And for those of you that are familiar with um, Magic the Gathering or the cards and the Planeswalkers, you would, you would probably know that that's most likely either something that Amuket himself built or uh, it's, something, it's actually Amuket in the distance towering over his domain. Which, again, it gives a real sense of, yes, he's the one in charge here. Now, again, I, I have not read, followed the story completely. I don't know how much control he has over this plane. All I know is he, he has a strong presence here. And I love how a lot of, especially if, you're, uh, if you have this P PDF, look at the first few images you will always see, I think, his horn just towering off in the distance. You know, behind structures, behind pyramids. It's really foreboding and intense. Especially, um, I think there's, there's a card, I think they actually quote some of the cards here. The island card uh, for the Omicat series actually has a picture of a, an Egyptian-like city with the horns in the background. Uh, the card, uh, okay, that's not a card name. That's just titled Amaket. The Searing Suns card has an, an image of a human trying to find shelter as the sun is basically bringing him alive. And in the distance, you see the horns. It's really powerful. Uh, symbology, I think. I don't know if it's a structure or if it's him. Well, let's find out. So... Uh, the world of Amuket, the towering gold encrusted monuments break the unending monotony of the horizon formed of the sun blasted sand. Awe inspiring animal headed gods walk among the people, offering them care and protection from the horrors of the desert. A wide life giving river offers its abundant bounty, providing for every physical need. Happy and hopeful, people offer sacrifices in grand temples dedicated to their benevolent gods, addressing their spiritual needs, for they know that this life, as wonderful as it might be, is just the beginning. A prelude to the perfection that awaits them in the afterlife, promised to them by, the, by their god Pharaoh. So, okay, we're getting a lot of, already a lot of similarities uh, to our own uh, Egyptian culture, which I find very interesting. I thought they were just going to go for the aesthetics and all that, but no, it seems like they're going really, you know, going for it, like even with the whole Pharaoh situation. Omoket is a plane of the Dichomity. I, I honestly do not know how to pronounce that word. I do apologize. Beyond the lush river valley spreads an endless scorching desert. 
Accursed, desiccate mummies roam that desert while caref carefully embalmed mummies attend to the needs of the living in the glorious city-states. Interesting that uh, the mummies that are properly created seem to look after the humans, whereas the ones that were clearly you know, just mummified and then left and forgotten have sort of become like the general stereotypical uh, zombie. The people have everything they need. They are protected from the desert heat and the wandering mummies by a magical barrier called Hikma. And they spend their lives in focused training, honing body mind to perfection. Yet they eagerly anticipate the time when they will be permitted to die in combat and leave this world behind. Interesting, very warlike civilization we have here. On the surface, Amunket seems to be a marvelous place to live. But something unsettling and nefarious lurks behind the grand facade. The wise and benevolent god Pharaoh said to be busy preparing uh, the wondrous for sorry to be uh, busy preparing the wondrous afterlife. Okay, for the wordy is actually. Nicol Balas, the malevolent dragon planeswalker, whose schemes reach far beyond this plane. And all that preparation and training, all the trials and contests, all the effort to be made worthy, all of this is meant to prepare the people of Amaket for transformation into an undead army under Balas' command. Right, already there, just from... The, now, folks, we haven't even gotten into any more of the lore. We we just got into the tip of the iceberg for the lore of this world, and already I want to run a game for it. God damn it, it's going to... Oh, I want to run a game for it, but I have no one to run a game for it. Uh, but, okay, let's... We're moving on. Uh, I'm going to try and... I'm going to try and curb my excitement, folks, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to try and calm. Who breathe. Okay, behind the, the next section is called Behind the Facade. Unknown to any of the plane's inhabitants, the entire society of Amaket has been manipulated by Nico Balas, who has seized control of the world, the gods, and the magic of the plane. Balas chose this plane for his schemes because of the presence of a magical substance called Lesotep, which interacts with the magic of necromancy in strange and powerful ways. Uh, conveniently, he also found here a pious, structured civilization that can that could easily subvert to his own purposes. Making himself go the god pharaoh, he brought the gods themselves under his control and eliminated anyone who tried to stand against him. When he transformed the world into a factory designed to produce a huge army of perfect undead soldiers, mummies embalmed uh, in Lesotep. That's very interesting. Like, that's, I, I'm, to be honest with you folks, that is really interesting because there was, now this is not the first time I've heard of a planeswalker, you know, manipulating the magic that overflows the planes. Like, last, I like the only one I ever heard that did it uh, before Nico Ballas now was uh, Nisa, the green druid elf planeswalker. And, it took her ages to channel it, and even then, in order to channel it, she had to go to a specific spot where most of the ley lines were intersecting. Like, it took her a huge amount of effort to do it, but Nico Balas seems to have been able to, like, it seems like he didn't have to maybe go through that issue. It, it suggests that like, he just showed up, saw this plane, and was like, you know what? This plane's mine now. And he's like, I don't, I don't know the power of Nico Balas, to be specifically. The only extent of his power that I know of is that one, he's a dragon, two, he's a planeswalker, and then three, uh, apparently he's strong enough to take that, take on, and not only take on, but completely devastate the organization known as Gatewatch, which is an organization founded by Jace, the blue, f most famous blue planes, uh, blue planeswalker, and he, uh, along with Liliana. The powerful necromancer, uh, Garut, the green barbarian planeswalker. He Nigel Ballas took all of them on. Oh, and Chantra. He took all of them on and basically nearly killed them all. 
to the point where they had no choice but to retreat. I, I, I don't... I, I, again, I'm not... completely sure how powerful Nico Ballas is, but this and that story is making me like, holy fucking shit! <laughs> In D&D terms, we are talking... CR 25, I think. I, That's me guessing, folks. Like, wow. I wish I bought the, uh, the Nico Ballas decks now, because... Also, from actually, from what my, my recollection is, Nico Bala, Bolas is the only Planeswalker who harnesses all five colours. Now... I'm not sure if there is another Planeswalker that can play all five. If there is, please let me know. I would be happily to correct myself. Uh, you can message me via the Discord s server chat that I've already set up. I've already previously mentioned in my videos. It's much easier to get in touch with me via that. So, again, if you're interested in quickly messaging me, use that, please. Uh, I can occasionally look at the stream chat, but I can't. It's not reliable. But okay, folks, we're moving on now. Adapting the peculiar magic of the plane, Bolas found a means to preserve the combat skills of the living after death. He has selected five aspects of character that he desires most in his undead soldiers, and has built a society, the society of Amuket around a series of trials designed to hone and perfect those aspects of body and mind. Throughout their lives, the people of the plane believe they are drawn nearer to the promised afterlife, and they, and at last they die in the final trial, a mass battle with no survivors. But rather than earning a place in the afterlife, they are instead embalmed in Lesotep and stored in Bola's great ne necropolis, added into the ranks of his undead army. Curse of the Wandering. Okay, folks, let's get. We're not. I, I, judging by the next image, which is of the from the card, uh, grasping dunes. I believe we're going to talk about the desert now. Part of the magic of Amuket that Bolas has been able to exploit is the ne the necromantic phenomenon called the Curse of the Wandering. This naturally occurring magic causes any being who dies on the plane to rise again after a short time. Cursed with an insatiable hunger and an irresistible drive to attack the living, the desiccated mummies created by the Curse of the Wandering fill the desert wasteland that dominates the plain. Constantly threatening what little life remains, but the people of Amaket do not fear the threat of the attack as much as they dread the knowledge that all who live will one day die and fall under the same curse. Death under the effect of the Curse of the Wandering is a terrifying afterlife filled with endless suffering. What Godfair Nico Ballas offers to the people of Amaket is an alternative to an eternity of wandering the afterlife of glorious delights. And all they do, uh, need to do is attain this eternal bliss is to prove that they are worthy. As such, the threat of the curse of the wandering is a strong motivation for people to undergo the trials of devotion that the God Pharaoh demands. Okay. Now, next we are talking about uh, putting devotion to the test, which I believe is most likely tell, giving us more information about this, these trials that the people of Amunket must go through. The inhabitants of Amunket, mortal and divine alike, believe that the god Pharaoh left the five gods as stewards of the populace when they departed to prepare the afterlife. While he is gone, the god Pharaoh expects the people to devote their lives to proving they are worthy of this great reward, since the afterlife will be perfect. The people who enter it must also be perfect. The gods are custodians of the path to the afterlife, established by the god Pharaoh to purify the, and perfect the people who follow that path and undergo its trials. Each god oversees one of the five trials instructing the initiates who prepare to face that trial by helping them cultivate one of the five aspects of mor moral perfection. Solidarity. Oketra, the true, the cat-headed god of solidarity, 
teaches that the unworthy shall know and respect all others whom the God Pharaoh deems as worthy. For in the afterlife, all will be together in purpose and in action. Knowledge. Kefnet, the mindful and ibis headed god of knowledge, teaches that the worthy shall cultivate the, a, a nimble mind, one capable of perceiving the wonders beyond imagining that await in the afterlife. Strength. Ronas, the indomitable, the cobra headed god of strength, teaches th that the worthy shall hone a strong body that can endure throughout an endless life. Ambition. Bantu, the glorified, the crocodile-headed god of ambition, teaches that the worthy shall strive for greatness, as supremacy will be rewarded in the afterlife. Zeal, Hazoret, the fervent, the, the jackal-headed god of zeal, teaches that the worthy shall rush towards the afterlife with unhesitating fervor. F fervor? Vevor? Mm, whatever. Relentlessly, they will rise to overcome any obstacle in the way and earn a place at the god pharaoh's size. Initiates who pass one of the trials are rewarded a kartokfi, a magical emblem that they will take with them to the afterlife. The trials culminate in the trial of zeal, which is a combat to the death. Dur dying in this final uh, battle is proof of worthiness, with a glorified death er earning the initiate a place in the afterlife. The bodies of the slain are loaded into a funerary barge, uh, funerary barges, and sent through the gate to the afterlife. But this is not an end; rather, it marks the beginning of the most wondrous part of the initiate's existence. Each looks forward to the death in the final trial, hoping to find a glorious end at the hand of a close friend, so that together they can live as eternals in the afterlife with the god Pharaoh forever. Wow. I wonder what happens if someone was to survive this battle. You know, and like, don't get me wrong, I imagine they arrange it so that you you cannot possibly win against your opponent. But like, the thing is, they want a glorious death. So, therefore, they, they're they not going to, you know, weaken the initiate. More so, they'll just f try and capture something strong and powerful and then unleash it upon the, the initiate. But okay, this also comes with a new background as well, folks. Uh, the initiate. But anyway, the people of Nakatomun, the citizens of Umaket, begin training for the trials of the five gods at a very young age. Children as young as five years old are invited to become acolytes, the first stage of their spiritual development. An annual ceremony serves as a rite of passage for these youths. Marking, them the be marking the beginning of their journey towards the afterlife. After completing their training and the construction of the obelisk that will be def defended during the trial of solidarity, a crop of acolytes is finally prepared to stand before the five gods in the ceremony of measurement. Those who are judged worthy are asked to continue their journey towards the afterlife as the god pharaoh's initiates. Others are selected by individual gods to take an alternative route to the afterlife, becoming advisors in the service to the gods. But some stand in the light of the two sons and are deemed unworthy of either course, lacking in the virtues necessary to secure entry into the afterlife. In particular, acolytes who doubt the god Pharaoh's teachings or the way of the life in Nakatamun are, are culled from the crop and exiled from the city-state. Your character's background can reflect the results of the ceremony of measurement. And such background, new background is um, initiate. Uh, there's also visor and dissonator. Uh, and we're going to cover each one. So we'll start with the initiate. You are an initiate on the path to completing the trials of the five gods in hope of earning a glorified debt in the final trial of zeal. Some combination of your natural aptitude, your, your crops needs uh, and your teacher's assessment while you were you are an acolyte led you to focus uh, your training on one particular area of specialization, hand-to-hand -hand combat, long-range combat or spellcasting 
but only a well-rounded initiate can be called can be called truly worthy of, of the afterlife. If you are a Hanahan specialist, consider the, uh, the barbarian, fire, monk, paladin, or rogue classes. As a long-range command special, uh, specialist, you might be a fighter, ranger, or rogue. If you are a spellcasting specialist, you might be a bard, sorcerer, wizard, and, and beyond this initial choice, you might consider multiclassing or using feats to round out your skills in all three areas. Skill proficiencies, athletics and intimidation. You get one type of gaming set and you are proficient with vehicles, uh, land vehicles to be more precise. You get your equipment will be a simple puzzle box, a scroll containing the basic teachings of the five gods, a gaming set, a set of common clothes, and a belt, belt pouch con uh, containing 15 gold pieces. If you have completed any of the trials before the start of the campaign, you are also have uh, cartouches you have earned. And your feature is Trials of the Five Gods. Your life is oriented around your, your participation in the five trials that will determine your worthiness in the afterlife. While you prepare for and undergo these trials, you have, you have constant access to training. A comfortable place to live and regular meals prov are provided to you by Servitor Mummies, the Anointed, under the supervision of the Viziers. You can enjoy these benefits only as long as you obey the social norms, societal norms of Nakhtamun. Training for your trials with or without your crop. Obeying the orders of the gods and following the instructions of their viziers. If you violate these norms, you risk being treated as a dissenter. Uh, see the trials of the five gods for more information about undertaking the trials and their rewards. Okay, suggested characteristics. Initiate's life is focused on the trials, but it doesn't need to be all about the trials. Some... Though some initiates are highly focused on their train, most undergo that train while also experiencing joy, sorrow, love, loss, or anger, jealousy, hope, fate, and delight. The whole range of more moral emotions and experience. The afterlife might be a constant presence in the initiate's mind, but it is the culmination of a life well lived, not a replacement for it. Now, you get, uh, let's see here. You actually, yep, you actually do have um, some unique personality types and stuff for this. Which is quite good because I've noticed that in some of these uh, PDFs, they actually just simply replace, uh, they, they use um, the player's handbook uh, personality stuff and bonds and ideas and whatnot in place of making their own. So I like how this one seems to be going original. Ah. Uh. I have all. I always have a joke on hand when the mood gets too serious. I use sarcasm and insults to keep a distance between myself and my crop mates because I don't want to get attached to them. I'll settle for nothing less than perfection in myself, in my crop mates, and everything. I am so focused on the glorious afterlife that nothing in, lo in this life can shake my calm resolve. I enjoy using my skills to help those who lack the, those same skills. I train hard so that I can play hard at the end of the day. I fully expect to play even harder in the glorious afterlife, but I'm not in a, uh, but I'm not in a hurry to get there. I'm perfectly happy letting others pick up the slack for me while I take it easy. I constant, I'm constantly sizing up everyone around me, thinking about what kind of op opponent they will be in the final trial. And yeah, folks, uh, again. Remember, when it refers to crop mates or the crop, it's basically all the collection of all the initiates that are that are, that will be basically, I imagine, fighting against each other in the test of the zeal. The last final test. Now we're on to the ideals. Solidar like it seems that these are focused on, with the exception of the sixth one, focused on the gods themselves. Solidarity. The, the thing that matters uh, most of all is that we are there for each other. Knowledge. The world is a puzzle, a mystery waiting to be solved. Strength. All that matters to me is my own perfection. Let, anyone, let everyone else seek that perfection in their own way. Ambition. I'm going to prove that I deserve, uh, I deserve only the best of everything. Zeal. 
anything worth doing is worth uh, throwing my whole self into. Redemption. I will try in all the harder to make up for the debt I've I entertained when I was younger. Quite interesting. Uh, now for the bond. One of my crop mates is my dearest friend, and I will, and I hope we will face each other in the final trial. Two. I'm in love with a vizier. Three. I am particularly drawn to one of the five gods, and I want nothing more than to win the gods partic that god's particular favor. Four. I am more devoted to Nak Nakatamun and its people than I am to any of the ideals of the gods. Five. My weapon was a gift from my beloved from a beloved trainer who died in an accident. Six. I, I carry a memento of my time as an acolyte, and I treasure it above all other things. Again, I really like how they're making unique uh, personality stuff and characterist character characteristics for this class sorry for this background and for this pdf it's really exciting it's I, I feel like this is one of the best pdfs now we're on to the flaw i am easily distracted by an attractive person which could be the death of me in the trials i really wanted to be a vizier and i'm angry at the god who didn't choose me training for a lifetime to die in the end seems like a big waste of energy I am not all sure I'm able to grant a glorified debt to any of my crop mates. I have a lasting grudge against one of my crop mates and each of us uh, wants to see the other fa uh, fail. 6. I think I figured out what this world, sorry, that this world is not what it seems. Something dark is going on here. And they are the personality. They are the personality stuff for the background initiate. Very interesting, and I, I, again, I'm already thinking of a campaign uh, for all this, and it's re it's really bothering me that I have no one to, um, you know, play this with. Uh, vizier, you are a vizier, a servant of your god. You perform. You uh, perform. The tasks that are essential to facilitating the initiates, uh, initiates journey, so that the gods reward you with entry into the afterlife with the Pharaoh, God Pharaoh's blessing. You hope to achieve the most honored status in the afterlife by being the best possible servant to your god. As a vizier, you have, you can have any class, but you are especially like especially likely to be a cleric, a druid, particularly if you serve Rohanas. Uh, or a paladin. Your skill proficiencies are history and religion. Tools you get one type of artisan tool and one type of musical instrument. Uh, you also get access. To, you, your starting equipment can also include a set of artisan's tools or a musical instrument, one of your choice, a scroll of your god's teachings, a, a vizier's cartouche, a set of fine clothes, and a pouch containing 25 gold pieces. And your feature is a voice of authority. Respect my authority. Uh, your voice is the voice of your god, at least in theory. Your job might include training and instructing initiates, but they are required to obey you. In any circumstance, initiate is expected to defer to you, to your voice, and obey your commands. If you abuse this authority, though, your god might personally punish you. Very interesting. So you can't really uh, get your way all the time. But at the same time, you have a lot of power. Alright. Now we have the, person the suggested characteristics of a vizier. And now this is going to be interesting. I I'm curious about what, they can get, what this will suggest. Everything I do, I do gracefully and deliberately. And with complete confidence. Well... Okay, they actually recommend... Okay, your personality trait is actually... Wait, hold on. Ideal. Uh-huh. Okay, so everything is actually... Everything except for your flaw... Actually, no, sorry, not everything. So a lot of these uh, suggested characteristics are in correlation with your god. For, uh, and I'll mention the god at the end of each personality trait that has a recommended god. Everything I do, I do gracefully and deliberately with a complete confidence. Uh, okay, okay, 
I probably butchered that pronunciation. Nothing can shake my rock hard focus. Okatara. When I am at peace, I am an oasis of perfect calm in the world. When I am roused to anger, I am the embodiment of terror. Kefnet. I enjoy teasing the, ac the acolytes and the initiates with juicy tidbits of knowledge wrapped up in fiendishly difficult puzzles. Kefnet. I have the utmost faith in myself and my abilities. Ronas. I get restless when uh, life in the city feels too tame, too safe. Ronas. I enjoy solitude as an opportunity to plan my victory. Bantu. I use satire as a way to undermine the teachings of the other gods. Bantu. I love, I love fight and feast with equal zeal. Hazaret. I think of those in my care as my family. In a way that most people have trouble understanding. Hazaret. Ideals. Solidarity. The worthy, the worthy must respect the worthy. In the afterlife, all will be united in, the, in goal and action. Okatra. Knowledge. The worthy shall cultivate a nimble mind so as to perceive the, wonder, the wonders beyond the imagination that wait in the afterlife. Kefnet. Strength. The worthy shall hone a strong body so that they can withstand the boundless energies of the afterlife. Ronas. Ambition. The worthy shall strive for greatness, for supremacy in life. In life leads to supremacy in the afterlife. Bantu. Zeal. The worthy shall rush to the god Pharaoh's side with relentless passion, rising to overcome every obstacle in their way. Hazaret. And Nakatum. The life of the city is ordered according to the plan of the god Pharaoh. And the order must be preserved at all costs. Bond. Bond, sorry. My loyalty to my companions embodies the ideal of loyalty to my god. Orkatra. The teachings of my god are more precious to me than any possession. Kefnet. I will do anything to defend the temple of my god from any harm or desecration. Ronas. I am committed to the service of my god because it, it's my sure ticket to the afterlife. Bantu. I love my god and never want this, my service to end. Hazaret. I have a close friend or lover who is also a vizier. Flaws. I'm in love with an initiate and I want to shield this person from death and the trials. I secretly wish I had not been chosen as a vizier so I could participate in the trials as an initiate. I secretly question whether the gods care at all about us or what we do. A vizier of another god seeks my debt in retribution for a past insult. I am terrified of what lies beyond the, the gates to the afterlife. I secretly believe that the god pharaoh's return will not bring a uh, blessing to the world. Interesting. Very interesting. Both the initiate and advisor, I like how they both have either the possibility of you playing a very loyal and loyal uh, member of the plan for Nico Bolas, but at the same time, they give you the option to be the type of character that would, in the end, turn against him or turn against the trials. Next, we have this uh, dissenter. Which I'm guessing is the people who um, were kicked out. Even in the carefully constructed and curated city-state of Nakatumun, and in the presence of the five gods, some people re rebel against the doctrines of the god Pharaoh. They don't challenge the existence of the gods of curse, for those gods are visible nearly every day in the streets of the city. Nor do they question the fact that uh, of life after death, which is plain to see within the anointed mummies that surround them, as well as the marauding mummies outside of, of the Hekma. Rather, these dissenters simply refuse to follow the ordained course of life that leads to the glorious afterlife. Some dissenters are spurred by fear, not wanting to subjugate themselves to a violent death in the trials, or in training to, for the trials. Some are moved by confidence uh, by, sorry, are moved by conscience, unwilling to kill their crop mates in the trials. 
for they cannot deny that the gods exist. They can they can deny that the gods are just and can fight to prove that that the dictates of the unjust gods need not be obeyed. Some believe that one god, probably Bontu, has corrupted the process of the trials and the path to the afterlife. Others correct correctly uh, intuit that the god Pharaoh did not actually be- have the people's best interests in mind when he or when he ordered their society. A character who is identified as a dead center loses the benefit of the initiates or visor's ba- background feature. In this place, the character gains the following feature. If they wish to have any hope of survival, whether hidden within the sea or cast out into the desert, the centers must help each other. You can find a place to hide, rest, or recuperate amongst other uh, uh, dissenters. They will help shield you from those who hunt you, possibly even risking their lives for you. And then that is it. Okay. With this alone, folks, and again, with the backgrounds alone, and with the world lore that we got alone, oh my god, so much potential. Forget the fact that the the plane ships are not generally meant to be played but just by themselves, but with Amuket itself, on its own, there is so much I would love to do. Oh my god, it's just so brilliant. But okay. We, we still have more stuff to cover. We still have races, the bestiary, and then actually making a planeswalker. Okay. Oh, okay. And apparently there are five human species. The five human, sorry, five humanoid races. Okay. First off, we'll be covering humans. Of the five humanoid, no, uh, humanoid races of Amukat, humans are the most diverse and adaptable. Different humans train in a wide variety of fighting styles, including those particularly favoured by the other races. A human mage might be may, uh, might use any of the five colours of mana, while mages of other races focus on one or of only two colours. Human viziers serve all five gods, and different human initiates excel in different trials. Humans defy t- trends and categorization, and opponents who face a human in one on one combat can't know what kind of fight to expect. From the foresight uh, and, c- and cunning often associated with Kefnet to a rootless that emulates a bon- emulates Bantu. At the beginning of a, such a fight, this uncertainty can give the edge to the human combatant. Once the fight has begun, of course, victory relies on different factors, but here, the human tra- uh, drive toward per- towards perfection once more tilts the scales in their favour. Humans are willing to go to any length, exhausting all available options to reach the pinnacle of achievement and win the favour of the god Pharaoh. As diverse as they are in most respects, the humans of Amuket share the drive towards perfection. However, they approach this challenge differently. Some humans specialize in relatively narrow set of skills, while others seek to master a wide range. Perfection through specialization. Humans who choose a path of specialization often piously identify with one of the five gods, often as a vizier and thus focus on one aspect of perfection. For them, the best way to earn a place in the afterlife is to hone a single facet of their character to the utmost quality, and as initiates, they hope to put that quality to use in all five trials. A maid initiate who identifies with Hazaret might cultivate cultivi- zeal above all of their virtues, master spells of fiery magic to channel that powerful emotion and rely on raw energy and enthusiasm to get through the four trials leading up to Hazret's final test. An initiate dedicated to Akatra, on the other hand, relies on cooperation, solidarity, and teamwork to get through the trials. Even Bantu's trial of ambition, which attempts to break down such bonds. I do apologize, folks. My uh, dog is getting excited because someone's walking by. Down, 
But okay. Oh. So yeah, so some humans try and fo specialize in one aspect rather than spread their uh, goals. To Ockertra's disciple, ambition means drive to help an entire crop of initiates achieve glory, to gather rather, rather than exalting oneself over others. Humans with this viewpoint see their chosen virtue colouring all others, and believe that the five gods offer their people a choice of which virtue to emulate and emphasize. So they're the, they're the humans that generally see perfection through specialization. Let's get on to the balanced uh, philosophies. Other humans believe that true perfection lies in mastering all of the virtues without giving preference to, to any one over the others. They compare themselves to the multifaceted stones whose beauty lies in the polished perfection of every facet. These humans are carefully are careful not to let their skills in one area outshine the other efforts. And if they grow to accomplish in one set of skills, they set it aside to concentrate their train on others until their abilities are balanced once more. Phys uh, philosoph uh, philosophically, such humans believe that the gods are five in number, so as so as to remind people of Amiket not to focus their attention on a single god or a single virtue, but to serve the gods equally and master their teachings to, to the same degree. Thus, they hope to achieve a balanced state of perfection that will guarantee de their mission into the afterlife. Now, we got some combat classes uh, discussions here, so let's see what goes on here. Most human initiates focus their studies on a single specialization, hand-to-hand -hand combat, long-range combat, or magical combat. Humans who choose hand-to-hand -hand combat may focus on single-minded devotion on uh, the use of a sickle-bladed kobesh, treat it as a long, treat it as a long sword, or other hand-to-hand -hand specialists like the broader perspective to study the use of all weapons equally. Some humans, however, applied the idea of perfection through the balance to these combat specializations, as well as fight fusing multi multiple styles together into a unique blend. For example, <coughs> a human initiate might use spells to shape sand into a sword, or to read arrows with life-draining magic. Other initiates strike with an axe in one hand while throwing smaller axes with the other, employing techniques of both hand-to-hand -hand and long-range combat. Some humans use slings to launch fireballs, create illusionary nets to restrain their opponents, or craft their blades from solid toxins. Very interesting. I do not see how you can do that in uh, any of the classes. But I suppose oh, players, uh, players and DMs could simply reskin uh, spells to give these effects. Now, let's get on to their traits, however. Uh, the humans of Amicat use the variant human traits presented in the player's handbook. This allows them to greater specialization from the beginning of their careers and, em and emphasize the diversity of the human's race. So basically they get a fee of your choice. You can speak uh, common and one extra language of your choice. You, get, you gain one proficiency in one skill of your choice. And you also get uh, your ability score increase is goes up two different ability scores of your choice increase by one. So again, fairly basic that um, the plane shifts are very seem to be very strict on the sense of when it comes to the humans. You you either pick a human, or you have to use the human that's presented in the plane shift of that plane. For example, if you're a human from the plane uh, Amunket, this plane. You have to use the human variant. You cannot use the default human. So that's very interesting. Now we're on to the Evan. Uh, or uh, Avian? Evan? Either way. Evan are human -like, uh, have human-like bodies, arms, and legs, along with bird-like wings and heads. Two distinct varieties of Evan are found in Nakatomi. One has a head of a hawk or a similar bird of prey with short wings allowing them allowing a fast flight. The other variety has the head of an ibis atop a long neck. 
with wide angular wings better suited for to soaring. All Evan have lean bodies with feathers extending from their heads down to their shoulders. Evan delight in flying above their foes, using their superior mobi mobility to conf confound and outpace their opponents. They love soaring through the sky as well, as well though the Hakama limits their altitude. Like all people of Deckard's Moon, they are grateful for the Hakama Moon's protective magic, of course, but they keenly anticipate the hour when the Godfair will return to dissolve the fail, letting them fly without limit in the afterlife. Combat classes. Spellcasters are common among Ibis headed Elven, uh, drawn to fellow teachings of the Kefnet. Their physical resemblance to the God of Knowledge is reflected in the mental discipline, focus, and confidence for which Elven spellcasters are known. They wield magic of air, wind, and sometimes water to, to uh, befoot buffet their foes, enhance their own flights and counter enemy attacks. Hawk-headed uh, Evan, who follow the path of the mage, are more likely to lean more towards the sand-based magic that can cloud the air, blast their foes, or bury their enemies in living dunes. Hawk-headed uh, Evan are... Hold on. Yeah, there's another one. Uh, Hawk-headed Evan are, mo are often drawn to master techniques of long-range combat. Whether the javelin that is the preferred weapon of many, the bow or other thrown weapons, whatever weapon they use, Evan hover and swoop in the air uh, above the fray, seeking the opportune uh, moment to strike in exactly the right place. In line with the teachings of the gods of solidarity, they often fly in tight formations with other Evan in their crops, supporting and protecting each other. Evan take great pride in precision of their attacks, relying on their keen vision and superior vantage points. They view the sharp tip of a javelin or arrow as a symbol of their love for, for precision, and some initiates maintain carefully tended collections of spearheads and arrowheads. A relatively small number of Evan are bo of both varieties end up focusing on hand-to-hand -hand combat, even there, they use their ability to fly to great advantage, often swooping down on their foes from a great height. The speed and power of a blow from a diving Evan can be early, early devastating, but such a strike poses a tremendous risk to the Evan as well as the target. An Evan who fails to pull up from the dive in time can suffer even worse injuries than the target of the attack. Evan often minimize this risk by hurling javelins while they dive, then pulling up nearly after a successful throw. Now, here are the traits of such Evan. Uh, it seems they have different uh, traits on their subspecies. So there actually is a point to the different heads. Now, all Evan get plus two to their dexterity. They age like humans, and they theoretically live into their 80s. Of course, most find a glorious or inglorious death long before that point. Alignment. Most Evan lean towards some form of neutrality. It, it, the Ibis-headed Evan focused more on knowledge than any other virtue are usually neutral. Ha uh, and the hawk-headed ones are inclined towards lawful neutral. Uh, speed. They have a base walking speed of 25 feet and you have a fly speed of 30 feet. You can't use your flying speed while you're wearing medium or heavy armor. If your campaign uses a variant rule for encumbrance, you can't fly using speed use, using your fly speed if you are encumbered. And you can write, read, write, as I speak, uh, read and write common and avian. Now, if you're an ibis head, uh, headed avian, you get an intelligence increase of one, and you get the benefit of Kefnet's blessing. You can add half of your proficiency bonus rounded down to any intelligence check that you make that doesn't already include your proficiency bonus. That's pretty good. And then the uh, hawk-headed ones, you get your wisdom score increases by two. What the hell? Okay. Uh, Hawkeye, you have proficiency in the perception skill. In addition, attacking at long range doesn't impose disadvantage on your ranged uh, weapon attacks. Okay, so you can attack uh, so you can attack as far back as you want. That is really cool. Really powerful.
Okay, next up we have the Kenra. <clears throat> the Kenra are, are of Omiket are tall and lean, with graceful, bo graceful bodies and heads that strongly resemble jackals. Their snouts are long and sharp, and their angular ears rise uh, straight above their heads. Their bodies are covered in dark, sleek hair that ranges from a brown of the desert sands to the ebony black. Despite their sharp teeth, they consider biting to be an uncouth and unworthy combat tactic. Nearly every uh, Kenra is born uh, a fraternal or identical twin, and a pair of Kenra twins forms an extremely close emotional bond, unknown to most other residents of Amuket. The death of one twin in training or as a child causes a tremendous shock to the survivor, who typically grows more aggressive and foolhardy in battle. The rare Kenra who, who are born without twins are believed to have killed their siblings in the womb, and they are called thus viewed as natural born initiates, sure to achieve a glorified death in the trial of zeal. Very interesting. Strength and zeal. Many Kenra believe that they are created in the, in the image of Hazaret, and though they venerate all five gods in the manner of all, in the manner of all citizens of Nectamun, they have a special affinity for the teachings of philosophy of the god of zeal. These Kenra share a deep love of combat, especially hand-to-hand -hand combat, and they devote themselves to their training in particular intensity. The familial bond experienced in the family temple of Hazaret's monument is part of every Kenra's experience as one, one of a pair of twins. As such, these Kenra sometimes think of themselves as Hazaret's children before they finish the fourth trial. For her part, Hazaret seems to favour Kenra among her viziers, and some say that she shows particular favour to Kenra initiates who survive um, to reach the zeal of tri uh, trial of zeal. Other Kenra choose to distance themselves from Hazaret and, reckless, and the reckless battle friends who she encourages. They devote themselves instead to honing their physical strength, resilience and adaptability, inspired and guided by the teachings of Ronas. These Kenra have a great fondness for wrestling, or tussling as they often call it, and they keep careful track of the matches they win and lose against other initiates. They often seek out matches against the Minotaurs, enjoying the challenge of pinning their snow snowy strength against the brute muscle uh, of larger and heavier opponents. Now, the classes that you often find for, of Kinra, they are especially devoted to Hezaret. The Kinra who are especially devoted to Hezaret are particularly drawn to hand-to-hand -hand combat styles, but the other styles each have their own appeal, and Kinra initiates might find themselves specialised in any of the, of the three. Kinra who focus on hand-to-hand -hand combat often wield a kopesh, a large sickle-bladed sword, as their weapon of choice, which is treated as a long sword. Kinra wield these blades with devastating uh, accuracy and powerful landing, one crushing blow after another in a hail of furious attacks. They favour lightweight armour that doesn't impede their movement, and often comparing fighting and organized ranks to wearing a leash that limits their ability to charge, lunge, and roll away from danger. Their natural aggression makes them ideal shock troops, scouts, and skirmishers, and that aggression is even more pronounced in Kenra who have already lost their twin, and who sometimes lose any sense of self-preservation as a result. Kenra who focus on long-range combat prefer hurled weapons, spears, and javelins, over bows and slings. They are known and feared for their deadly accuracy. They carry small cases of javelin, javelins into combat and feel ashamed if they reach the end of the battle without any weapons left on thrown. A kindred might ride a ch on a chariot as a spear thrower, sometimes augmenting their augmenting attacks with minor spells of fire magic. Many kindred mages specialize in fire spells, creating blades and hails of flame to sear and scorch their foes. They, their strategy emphasizes overwhelming initial assaults in magical emulation of Hazaret's battle frenzy, 
Others prefer magic that augments their natural speed and strength, bolsters their endurance, or drains the strength from their enemies. They work to hone their spell alongside their bodies, incorporating the elements of hand-to-hand -hand combat into their spell casting. All right, and you have and you have the traits for your uh, Kinra is your dexterity score increases by two, and your strength in uh, score increases by one. Now, they usually uh, they reach adulthood in their early teens. And Kenra initiates are usually the youngest in a uh, crop, completing the trials of their late teen, completing the trials by their late teens, even without a violent death, they rarely live past A. Uh, they tend to lean towards the chaotic alignment. They have no particular inclination towards good or evil. Their base walking speed is three five feet. You get proficiency with with the kopash spear and javelin. And you, you have the twins feature. If your twin is alive you and, and you can see your twin, whenever you roll a 1 on an attack roll ability check, an attack roll ability check or saving throw, you can re-roll the die, but you must use the new roll. If your twin is dead, or if you are born without a twin, you can't be frightened. You can speak, read, and write common and kenra. We have two more uh, races, folks, and then we'll be halfway through the PDF, which means I will probably end the video there, and then I will cover the Trials of Combat, which will also cover um, will which will also tr cover the domains of the gods for those that play um, clerics. And then by page 30, we should, we should be able to reach the bestiary and talk about it. But for now, I'm going to try and just focus on the races. Oh, scroll down too high. Up. Next, we have the Minotaurs. Minotaurs are powerfully built barrel-chested humanoids with heads resembling rams. Their horns curl tightly against the sides of their heads to encircle their ears and manes of shaggy fur. Short in females fall over their broad sh uh, shoulders. As their appearance suggests, they, th they combine physical strength with stubbornness, bravado and reckless behavior. They revel in combat, especially when the odds are against them. Uh, and they and also they seem overwhelming. Minotaurs are rowdy, boisterous, and direct to the point of rudeness. They have no qualms about declaring what they want and defying others to keep it from them. In combat, they bellow loud challenges and defiance of their foes, and roar with laughter as they triumph. Minotaurs believe they hold a unique. Uh, place among the race of Omicat. The Krinra can look to Hazaret, the Naga to Ronas, and the Evan to Kefnet to, to see themselves represented among the gods. Humans have no single god to look to, which explains why they demonstrate such variety, but only one god be bears a pair of curving horns, the god pharaoh himself who hold a special place for many of the Minotaurs of Amuket. Rootless and Reckless Even those, min those Minotaurs who feel personal affinity for the horned god, god Pharaoh align themselves cl most closely with Bantu or Hezaret in practice, driven by a fierce and powerful desire to prove themselves, to earn glory in the afterlife, and to win a glorious death. They view every challenge or obstacle a chance to demonstrate their powers. With rootless abandon they slash, batter and pummel their way through anyone or anything that stands in their way of their own advancement. With reckless vivor they fight without heed for their own safety, shrugging off blows uh, of their enemies. Now the classes that they generally t uh, follow their size and strength makes Minotaurs ideally suited for hand-to-hand -hand combat, though most effective on the offense, delivering an endless blow of barrage of attacks. 
that will keep their foes off balance, shattering their, sh their opponent's shields and weapons, and inevitably break their opponents. These Minotaurs favor a large, heavy weapon such as axes, mauls, and two-handed kobeshes treated as great swords, but they are also fond of unarmed combat. Many love to throw their weapons aside in favor of pummeling their opponents into submission with their horns and bare hands. Believing that such a victory is more glorious and more humiliating to the loser. But though Minotaurs are known for their physical strength, size and strength, this hardly preludes to the presence of keen minds and powerful spellcasters among them. Though they are fewer in number uh, than the hand to hand specialists, Minotaurs may just draw their natural ferocity to instill terror in the hearts of their opponents. With a terrible roaring bellow, they manifest their fury as blasts of flame, or imbue their own horns with, and fists with searing heat to make their physical attacks more deadly. The relatively few Minotaurs who specialize in long range combat enjoy one aspect of that style in particular the, the opportunity to draw first blood, marking the moment when, uh, when a battle has truly begun. Minotaurs use heavy bows and javelins and take special delight in firing into the middle of an enemy for formations to sow as much chaos and confusion as possible. Now, your Minotaur traits are as follows. Your strength score increases by uh, 2 and your constitution score increases by 1. Now, Minotaurs reach full maturity in and around the age of 20. They typically become acolytes at around 8 or 9 years old, making them among the older members of their crops. Once they reach maturity though, Minotaurs age quickly, rushing headlong through the trials as they do all aspects of life, to complete them, to complete them before they pass, uh, pass their peak. A Minotaur allowed to die of old age would rarely see, see life beyond 40. Now, they, ha they lean towards chaotic alignments and they have a slight inclination towards evil. Now, the Minotaurs have several features. Uh, your, moving, your walking, base walking speed is 40 feet. Your horns are natural weapons. Um, you can use them as natural weapons to make unarmed strikes. If you hit your, uh, with your horns, you deal bludgeoning damage equal to 1d6 plus your strength uh, modifier. You automatically gain proficiency in intimidation skill. And when you're reduced to zero hit points but are not killed outright, you can instead drop to one hit point instead. And you can't but you cannot use this feature again until you finish a long rest. They also get savage attacks. When you score a critical hit with a melee weapon attack, you can roll one of the weapon's damage die uh, dice one additional time and add it to the uh, to the extra damage of the critical hit. You can speak and read common and minotaur. Last but not least we have what possibly is my favourite race because I love reptiles and lizards and snakes is the naga. Hmm. Naga resemble enormous snakes with shoulders, arms and a torso that resembles a human a humanoid form. They typically hold their heads and torsos off the ground while moving, but can increase their speed by lowering their bodies and using their hands for extra propulsion. They adorn their torsos with armor, jewelry and vague nod towards the clothing worn by other races. Male Naga have broad hoods uh, wider than their shoulders, uh, while females have narrower hoods and longer faces. Naga believe in principle called the, sweet, the sweetest harmony, which describes a perfect balance between the body and mind. Finding that balance as they understand it is a sure path to glory in the trials, since the combination of physical and mental preparation will ensure a success in every trial. For an example of this sweetest harmony, they point to the Luxa River, and the land it, it, it nourishes, which exists in a delicate and light-giving balance. Either one without the other would be diminished and useless. 
Just so mental strength supports physical capabilities, the physical fortitude feeds the mental uh, tendency, so neither mind nor body can exist in isolation. In the same way that the Naga believe in, uh, that Kefnet and Rojas be, uh, exist in independence, uh, and that their trials are best conceived as two halves of a whole, but in practice, as much as they strive for balance and harmony, most Naga, Naga identify more strongly with one god other than the other. Mm. To this benefit uh, of those Naga who struggle with the ideal of the sweetest harmony, the train of acolytes encourages specialization. Thus, Naga who follow in the path of the snake-headed god Ronas can cultivate their physical strength as they specialize in hand-to-hand -hand combat styles, while other Naga follow the teachings of Kefnet and the other combat styles. Naga who specialize in hand-to-hand -hand combat rely on axes, daggers, and short swords, but also on their own fangs and the constricting strength of their serpentine bodies. They make extensive use of poison, co uh, of poison coating their weapons with mul multiple layers of deadly substances, including but by no means limited to their own venom. Quick and well-timed and well-placed blows, followed by equally nimble retreat, allow many Nanga to triumph over their opponents who might seem stronger with acknowledgement of the sweetest harmony. These Nanga cultivate an understanding of st strategy and tactics that enhance their physical training. Speed and accuracy are equally important to Nanga, who specialize in long-range combat. Some prefer to analyze the battle from a distance and pick out their strongest opponents with their ranged weapons, including poisoned spears and arrows. Others ride in on chariots, driven by trusted drivers, usually other Naga, and throw their spears from the, mis from, from the midst of battle. In any case, they excel at finding and exploiting strategic advantages. Some Naga art mages are drawn to the examples of Kefnet, make extensive use of illusionary magic to trick and mislead their opponents. Others apply Rona's teachings in their studies, wielding poisonous magic that weakens their opponents or kills them outright with clouds or darts of deadly toxins. Still, others in the service of the ideal of balance use magical power of their minds to enhance their physical strength and speed. And all Nagas share the following traits. Your ability score increases our constitution increases by two and intelligence by one. Like humans, Nagas reach adulthood in their late teens and they show no signs of aging beyond that point except by growing larger. So in theory, a Naga could live well over a century. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. Alignments. Most Naga are either neutral or neutral evil in alignment. Naga stands at about, about 5 feet tall when upright, but uh, the total length of their bodies head to tail ranges from 10 to as much as 20 feet. Your size is medium. Your base walking speed is 30 feet. Burst of speed. By lowering your body to the ground and propelling yourself with your arms, you can move more quickly for a time. As a bonus action on your turn, if you have both hands free, you can increase your walking speed by 5 feet until the end of your turn. Natural weapons. Your fanged maw and constricting serpentine body are natural weapons which you, you can use to make unarmed strikes. If you hit with your bite you deal uh, 1d4 plus your strength modifier and your target must make a constitution saving throw. And on a failed save they take an extra 1d4 uh, poison damage. If you hit with a constrict attack you deal bludgeoning damage uh, equal to 1d6 plus your strength modifier and the target is grappled and they can escape with a dc8 plus your proficiency plus your strength modifier. Until the, grasp, the grapple ends the target is restrained and, can't, and you can't constrict another target. Poison immunity. You are immune to poison damage and can't be poisoned. Poison affinity. You gain uh, proficiency with the poisoner's kit. Languages you can speak, read, and write common and naga. Now, interesting note, because it is confirmed that they sometimes you use their own venom to coat their weapons, I would do an additional ruling that... Ooh, sorry. 
um, Nagas could actually use the feature, a similar feature that was proposed by the frog people. I can't remember what they're called. It was part of the charity for Tomb of Annihilation. And basically they have the ability to cope uh, daggers and darts in the, in the poison that their bodies secrete. I would offer the same situation for the Naga, but since it's more precisely from their teeth, I would say they were allowed to harvest the poison from themselves um, during a short rest. And they can apply that poison uh, that will last until the next short rest or long rest. I'll do something like that. Now, the next section is the Trials of, co of the Five Gods. But that is focused on the cleric, and we're not going to do that right now. However, we are going to talk about the end of this PDF, which is more relating to dealing with um, being a planeswalker in the setting. So let's just scroll down. Okay. Now there's a lot here, so we're going to cover it as quickly as we can. All right. The, mul the multiverse is a boundless expanse of worlds. These worlds are called planes, are as different from each other as one living being is different from another. Varying in size and shape, inhabitants and, in and environments, and even the laws of physics and magic. The existence of magic, though, is, co is a common factor that unites all the known planes. For most inhabitants of a given plane, that plane is the full extent of existence. Esoteric speculation might posit, posit the existence of other worlds, but such concepts are, are only theoretical. Only a handful of people on any given world knew, know the reality that all the planes are suspended together in a void called the ether, or more po uh, poetically, the blind eternities. Only one person in a million is born with the potential to travel from one plane to another, and only by a fraction of those with the potential to actually manage to ignite their sparks and become planeswalkers. Often this happens as a result of a great crisis or trauma, a near-death experience could ignite this, the spark, as could a life-changing ep uh, epiphany or even a revolutionary trance. But once their sparks are ignited, all planeswalkers gain the rare ability to open a pathway through the blind eternities and pass from one plane to another. The life of a planeswalker is a, li is a life choice and self-determination, unrestricted by the boundaries of the world of fate. Most planeswalkers dedicate themselves to some personal mission as they explore the secrets of the multiverse. Often they discover the depths of their own souls in the process. Now, this is the fourth Plane Shift article corresponding to the release of the fourth volume of The Art of the Magic the Gathering, which means at this point you could put together a four-person party of planeswalkers and have each one of them come from a different plane. Fundamentally, no game rules are attached to being a planeswalker. Traveling from one plane to another uh, in this sort of campaign is a lot like an overland travel in a normal campaign. It's about getting to where the adventure is. It's a story function, not a rules one. If planeswalking is part of the game campaign, then everyone in the party has to be able to do it. And so they can travel together. In modern magic, there's no way to bring to another living person along with you when you planeswalk. That means there's not likely, there's not really any question of a game balance where planeswalking is concerned. It doesn't make one character more powerful than another, and it doesn't make characters any stronger against the enemies they're fighting. Uh, so it's sometimes that they can be added to onto any other character without changing the character's class, race, or background. How does planeswalking work? Well, despite the name of this article series, it actually doesn't bear much resemblance to the plane shift spell. When characters plane walk, it usually takes prolonged focus to bring two worlds together and to create the bridge to cross between them. This process takes about a minute and is similar to casting a ritual, so it's not generally something a planeswalker can do to escape combat. It also doesn't allow, uh, mo uh, allow for much precision. As a, rule, as a rule, the point on the plane where the planeswalker arrives is 
up to the DM and is usually the same location for each visit a character makes to that plane. Occasionally in magic fiction, characters do planeswalk in the middle of combat, usually when something dire is about to happen. That includes the circumstances when a character's planeswalker spark first ignites. To model that, the DM's dis uh, at the DM's discretion now, at the DM's discretion, a planeswalker who's about to drop to zero hit points can make a charisma saving throw with a DC equal to the damage taken. On a successful save, the character instead takes no damage and planes walks away. It's up to the DM what plane that character ends up on because this isn't usually an intentional process. You could do a lot of adventuring uh, on just the four planes uh, detailed in the art books of the Planes of Oracle so far, but if you want to take your Planeswalker characters to Tyros, uh, Takir, Ravnica, uh, Dominaria, Meridian, Alara, Fiora, Lauren, Chimera, or any other plane in the Magic Multiverse, you can follow the example of what I've been doing with the. Uh, yeah, this is basically the guy talking about. You can take his example of Ting. Oh, I just lost a whole bunch of stuff there I was reading. Hold on, let me scroll back down. Um, but the most important thing in a campaign involving the Planeswalkers requires an agreement between the players and the DM, even more so than usual. If the players decide to ignore the plot hook set before them and go off anywhere in the multiverse just because they can, they can make the DM's job more taxing uh, than fun. It's one thing to have a Planeswalker, planeswalker pop off to Ravnica for an hour to buy a cup or, to buy a cup of coffee, but it's quite another for our players to decide that they that they want to take on the corruption of New Fraxia today instead of following the clues that lead clearly to the inner shot campaign. Speaking of New Fraxia, a campaign with a planeswalker is generally more fun with higher level characters. The planeswalkers who feature in the stories of magic are powerful mages of various kinds and their actions can sometimes decide the fate of whole planes. It doesn't always need to be like that, of course, but it can be hard to motivate pl uh, characters with, with the ability to travel literally anywhere to stick around and root out a, a nest of giant rats. And again, I do like how they notify that the general trope is rats. So, can player characters travel from Omuket to whatever plane on the Forgotten Realm lies on? That's up to you. The Plane Shift series more or less assumes a certain continuity from one multiverse to the next. Even as, for example, it makes no attempt to model Magic's five colors of mana in the D&D magic system. So there's no real reason an elf from Evrizika couldn't spark out and find herself on Kal Kaladesh as long as it works for your players and your campaign. So there you go, folks. At the very last paragraph, it even talks about like the the person who's been designing all these plane ships I, I get a strong sense it's the person who's right in Ravnica I have a very strong sense it's the same person even now this is only the fourth one that he released even at this point he was like hey I don't see a reason why they, they can't you know go to whatever like so there you have it folks full on confirmation that the the very makers of like so, like like it's this is apparently bit. I did not read that last section. I've never read that last section until now. Like oh my god, this is all I need. That's the confirmation. That's the, uh, okay. It's not okay. I will be honest. It's not one hundred percent confirmation, but it's like fifty five percent at mo at, at least. Come on, and that's all I need to have my games have my players become planeswalkers, and. I have some plans for that. Anyway, folks, I will cover more of Omicat at a later time. It's just that it's each it's about forty pages long, and the BCA section like it still has a lot to cover. Uh, like there's a lot of unique beasts to Omicat, and I still have to cover the cleric class uh, new abilities. Now, are there are new classes and apparent? Um, Apparently, the knowledge domain for this one is, is supposed to be different than the knowledge domain that you get from the player's handbook. So, I find that very interesting, and I'm looking forward to see what makes it differ from the other knowledge domains. Actually, hold on. Zeal. Ambition. Um, strength. 
No, 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 yeah. No, no, there you go. It says it right there. Kefnet's domain is identical to the knowledge domain in the Fire's Handbook. So yeah, there's, so there's only four new domains. And I will, I will try and cover them all. I, 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 I'll tr I promise you, I will attempt to cover them all. Th this series, I'm not going to let this series uh, fall behind like the others. Cause it, it's a series that I myself truly, truly enjoy. And I want to finish it. I want to play it so much. And the more I read, the more I want to get... Ugh, the more I want to do it. Hell, I might even set up a special reward for Magic the Gathering fans who are watching this on YouTube or on Twitch. Message me. Uh, whisper chat me or whatever you need to do on Twitch or whatever you need to do on YouTube or Discord. Message me and let me know if you would be interested in running a Magic the Gathering campaign. But we'll obviously wait until Ravnica comes out. For that. This is Wilf Ninja signing out. May the force be with you and remember Raw Furnished Stuff. And also, I'm going to end this the same way as I began it. Big shout out to uh, Shooting Dead, aka Dakota. Um, can't wait to play with you again. You're a great DM, you're a great player. I hope, I hope to talk to you soon. Uh, goodbye.